to categorise my life now in two ways. Before Lisa went missing and after Lisa went missing. Because I'm two different people. What a disservice to Lisa if I made a mess of my life when she doesn't even have hers. In Lisa's memory, I make sure that I have the best life that I can have whilst looking for her and looking for justice at the same time. Woman fear the violence of men, and many experience it. They have a terror of badlands, places that are lonely, abandoned, on the margins, places where they sense that harm has been done, where it seems that anguish is trapped. They hear the crack of a bit on branches, sense a shadow on the doorway. They imagine an unheard scream. A violated body dumped without ceremony. If they have to pass that way, they hurry. Dread at their heels. Their fear is a kind of terrorism that somehow manages to thrive in our culture. For most women who are murdered, the predator is a man they know, even a man they love. The setting is often the place that is meant to be the safest, home. But then there are men who are hunters of women. They grim, they stalk, they snatch, they kill. They know their way around the badlands. They can map rutted tracks and follow paths so narrow and twisted they are known as rats' tails. And some women become their victims. Lands. The 25 year old shop assistant had been at a party in a village caravan park. The Dorian family believe they must continue to have hope, but they say that Lisa is not the type of person to remain out of contact for this long. I had been in work on the Tuesday, and my phone rang, and it was Lisa's housemate, Lenice, her friend at the time, and she said, have you seen Lisa? I said, no, I haven't seen her. And she said, nobody has seen her. Nobody can find her. I said, what do you mean nobody can find her? And she said, she's been at the caravan all weekend. And nobody knows where she is. And I just remember thinking, hold on, hold on. We need to, right, take this back. Where was she? Who was she with? Let's try and work this out. And she said, the guy that she was with in the caravan has phoned and says he has no idea where she is. She ran out of the caravan and hasn't been seen since. She gave me the phone number for the guy at the caravan. And I phoned the guy who was last with her. And he said, you need to phone the police. I don't know where she is. I have no idea what happened. And to me, it was, it had went from, we can't quite get a hold of her, to, this is serious. I said to him, are you at the caravan? He said, yeah. I said, I'm calming down. I remember saying to mum, I'm going to the police station. I have a really bad feeling about this. And I would rather be wrong 
and be right and not report her? And she said, really? You really think you need to report her missing? And I said, yeah. And we drove down to Bangor Police Station. You know, I said, Lisa is with people that take drugs. You know, I hear bad things about them and nobody can find her. So they took the details. I said, I'm going to the caravan now. I'll report back to, you know, whatever I find out. So we went in my car down to Bally Halbert. Growing up, we were a very happy family. We were three sisters together. Kira didn't come until much later. I know from a very early age that Michelle and I both really looked up to Lisa. My childhood memories, we always were just laughing and getting on, and um, Lisa was just bubbly and outgoing, and she just had that aura. Everybody just paid attention to her when she walked into her room. We were all very close, and my mum tried to dress us together, and Lisa hated that. She was five years older than me. She had a real presence about her, even as a child, you know. She was friendly, but, but feisty at the same time, you know. She, she wouldn't have let anybody walk over her, even as a kid. Saturdays then were spent playing, you know, offices and we would have pretended to be office workers and put my mum's clothes on and the high heels and we were making messages to each other and, you know, we just loads of role play and, and just real good kind of sister, sister memories. In terms of nights out, you know, Lisa never wanted to go home. I never used to go home and used to join her at, you know, house parties and stuff like that. And, and we used to just get on really well that way. And, you know, we were always really close. In 2004, Lisa had everything to live for. She had big dreams of, of going abroad and, and living abroad. She had had a, an accident in work. She was going to be compensated for that. And um, she was looking forward to that money coming in because that was, that was going to change her life. She was just positive. She was positive about her future. She was positive about the friendship group that she was in. And, you know, really, there was just, there was nothing for us to worry about. Lisa and Jamie had gone out for quite a number of years and they decided that they had kind of come to the end of the road with the relationship. I remember going out shopping with her that year. She said to me, I don't know what to do, Joanne, because all my friends are his friends and I don't know how I'm ever going to get over not being with him if I have to keep socialising with them. And a sort of off-the-cuff remark I said, why don't you just go get new friends for a while? You know, start socialising somewhere else slightly different. And obviously had no idea the impact that that, that statement would have. She then did go and find new friends. And that's really what led to, to her being murdered. Lisa had had a long-term boyfriend. After Lisa broke up with that boyfriend, um, she began to be different. Lisa got involved with this set of people because she wanted to make new friends. This group seems to have latched in on her, and it's easy to see why they were drawn to her, because she was obviously a very vivacious, very attractive, very open-hearted, um, party-loving person. She got into the scene of drug-taking at the weekends. She loved going to clubs and raves, and, and that was her scene, and that's, that's where we did differ. When she got into this new crowd, we definitely noticed a decline. She had started to lose weight. I remember I could see her hip bones, you know, and I said, she said, oh yeah, I'm watching my weight. And I just knew that she'd watched her weight so long and that had never happened, so something different. 
had happened, and I thought, that's drugs. The family felt that Lisa had just got involved with people who were not their sort of people and who might not have been very safe people for Lisa to be around because she was not a person who had experience of those type of people. We just felt in our gut that there was something going wrong in Lisa's life. So I remember Mum and I saying, we'll go round and, and chat to her. As we were walking in, I seen a, a car in the driveway and it was scratched on the back of it with scum. And I'd never seen a car scratched with anything on it like that. And I remember going in and saying to her, what's the deal with the car in the driveway, Lisa? You know, and she just said, oh, no, that made an excuse. And I was asking her, you know, about this new boyfriend and what does he do? Who is he? What's his plans? What's your plans? What's going on here, Lisa? And one of the very last things she said to me was, stop giving me the Spanish Inquisition, Joanne. She just didn't want to talk about it. I remember walking away from Lisa's house after talking to her that day and thinking, I need to start finding out about these people. You know, she's obviously putting herself in a vulnerable situation or a situation that just didn't, it didn't sit right with me at all. I remember driving down the Bangor Road and my phone ringing. And it was a guy I had asked to find out who this boyfriend was. He said, get Lisa away from him. <laughs> you probably couldn't repeat the word he used. You know, bad news, Joanne, get her away. I tried to phone Lisa and it just rang and rang, no answer. And I thought to myself, right, not getting her, it's a Sunday night, maybe she's got a hangover, <laughs> you know, she's lying in bed, I'll, I'll get her again. You know, I knew, I knew I would speak to her again. I thought I would speak to her again. And that was the night that she went missing. I said, we're going to go to the caravan site. I'd never been to Ballyhalbert in my life. And once we hit those back roads, you couldn't have seen two feet in front of you. There were no street lights, none at all. It was pitch black and it was freezing. I can vividly remember thinking, Lisa wouldn't stand a chance walking out here. She couldn't have found her way anywhere along here because she just couldn't see where you were going. The caravan site's not open, so the only people there are people who work there or live there. I remember driving round where the caravan was, just the lights on, getting out of the car and how cold it was, and I thought, oh, Jesus, she's died of hypothermia. If she has been out in this, she wouldn't have survived the night. And I went into the caravan, and the first thing I noticed was the, the young guy that was was last with her on the chair. Baseball cap on, looked really young. You know, he just looked like a young guy, but he was a mess. The story that we were being told that Lisa ran out of the caravan went one way, the young guy went the other way. He then says he went to the caretaker's caravan and knocked the door and said, Lisa's gone. What seems to have happened on, on the night, as far as we know, is that Lisa was annoyed because a guy that she had seeing, been seeing hadn't called her and was supposed to, and she'd been kind of hanging around, waiting to hear from this person, and they hadn't got in touch. 
She was annoyed at being slighted by him in this way, so she just decided she was going to have a night out anyway. There was an invitation to go down to this caravan because uh, she knew this young fellow who was uh, acting as caretaker there. Gradually, people left, and until in the end up, there was just her and one other person there. There were various phone calls during the night, one of which, during one of which, the person that she was with said that um, she had gone missing, that they, they'd, they'd heard all these noises and seen flashing lights and things, and they'd stumbled out of the caravan and run, apparently in separate directions, and he hadn't seen her since. The guy that was in the caravan said, I can take you to her boyfriend's house, his flat. So I said, let's do that, let's get in the car. So um, him and myself and Lynnace drove to Ballywalter to her um, boyfriend's flat. Someone, again, that I didn't know came to the door. I said, I'm Lisa Dorian's sister. She's missing. He said, missing? More like missing in the head. And I just thought, OK, this is the calibre of people that we're dealing with here. There was nothing friendly about them. There was nothing, they had no concern for Lisa. We were called up the stairs, and Lisa's boyfriend didn't appear for at least a few minutes. There was no niceties. You just knew that they they didn't care about her. I remember phoning the police then and, and urging them to, to do something. In those days, there was a three-day cooling off period where if you were an adult and you went missing, chances were that you would come back. And I just knew that we couldn't wait three days. So I remember phoning them that night and saying, I've been in touch with her boyfriend now. You need to go chat to him. And by that stage, I didn't know what else I could do. So we went to bed that evening, not knowing where Lisa was. The last person who says he saw Lisa Dorian alive is a teenage boy. The teenager who has spoken exclusively to Spotlight claims he spent part of the weekend partying with her and that the last time he saw her was when the two of them bolted from a caravan in Ballyhalbert shortly before dawn on Monday, February 28th. He told us they'd been frightened by noises outside the caravan and as they ran from it, he says Lisa was gripping his arm. The last time I saw her, she was wiped out of her head, but alive and kicking. This is the only account the teenager has given to a journalist of the moment he claims he lost Lisa. I ran in zigzags. I thought somebody was going to shoot. I don't know why. Pitch black, no lights. Fuck all. The next day, then, things kind of stepped up a gear. So that day, a few of us got in the car, went down to Ballyhalbert. A lot of seaside places are a bit bleak out of season, but Ballyhalbert looked to me like a place that wouldn't be much better in season, really. There's no town, it's just a sort of like a couple of caravan parks. The whole place is kind of haunted with a sense of ruin, but also there's something just a bit sinister about it. It's the most easternly part of Northern Ireland. You could nearly touch Scotland from there. In the summer, it's a happy place. It's normally quite breezy and sunny and good light, nice big, big, big skies. But come the winter, it's dismal. When we were at the caravan site, we went to the, the office just to ask for information. 
So we went to the office and I remember speaking to the, the girl in the office who said there was a, a caretaker who lived on site. We chatted to her and we chatted to him. But there was very, there was no information forthcoming. He had met Lisa, he knew Lisa, but there was no information forthcoming as to where she could have been. And it was a very difficult conversation. Just felt a bit odd. The story that we were being told that Lisa ran out of the caravan went one way, the young guy went the other way. Didn't change. Things weren't progressing for us because the stories were the same. So that's all we had to go on. We had two people who were saying the same thing and we had no reason to disbelieve it. We had no reason then to ever suspect that someone would have wanted to hurt Lisa or that someone would have wanted to hurt Lisa, killed her and hidden her body. Whose mind would ever go to that place from someone just going missing? The only thing we could do was search. So we walked and walked and walked. Valley Halbert is really vast. It's a, an old airfield. So it's just miles and miles of fields, old buildings, old rubbish lying around. And it was freezing. I remember it was freezing. And I remember thinking she had these big fluffy white boots on. And I thought, you'll see them. You know, that was, it was a, a big marker for us. If we're looking for something, look for the fur, look for the fur. And there was just nothing. And I remember saying, we're actually looking for Lisa's body. Because I thought, she must have just fell and the cold had maybe. Had maybe got to her. Because we had never lived in a world where murder even featured. And that's not something that had even entered my head at this stage. I knew something was wrong. But I didn't know about murder. And that just went on for hours, of us walking and walking and walking. And it was like, when do you stop? When do you say, we can't do this on our own, we need the police? And it wasn't long after that that they rang and said, can someone meet us at Lisa's house? The police rang and said, can someone meet us at Lisa's house? We need to come and get a pair of trainers for a scent for the dogs. I remember thinking, a scent for dogs? What are we getting into? And we went down to your house in Bangor and it felt weird. You were going into her bedroom and lifting stuff and she wasn't there. And I remember giving them the wee, she only had little tiny feet, and giving them the, the trainers. And they put them in the, the evidence bag. And I just knew that something was really, really wrong then. And they were getting the dogs out the next morning to try and pick up a scent of where she'd gone.
to be honest with you, a lot of people were going missing, coming back, you know, a week later. There, there wasn't a great fuss about people who went missing in 2005. In March, we had heard the police were looking at the fact that there was a young girl missing from the North Down area on the Ards Peninsula. Um, the police didn't appear in our minds to be overly concerned about Lisa's uh, disappearance from her vanishing. Lisa attended a party here in Valley Halbert at the caravan site. Um, she hasn't been seen since, and we're out here searching today in the hope of finding something. But we just want to make the appeal that anybody who knows absolutely anything has any information, whether it be they think it's insignificant, everything's vital at this stage. At day six, everything's absolutely vital. Five a.m. in Bally Halbert, one week on from the disappearance. Police hoped that questioning motorists at the R. Lisa Dorian was last seen would provide some new information. The 25-year-old shop assistant had been at a party in a village caravan park. Yesterday, relatives and friends came here, still hoping she is safe and well. The day that we went to the caravan site, the police had asked us to go down and do media appeals. We'd never done anything in the press before. Had no reason to, we were just a normal family who lived a normal life, but thankfully the police were there to, to coach us and, and, and support us in, in doing that. But my mum wouldn't go. She said, girls, go and do what you need to do go and do the interviews. You know, she, she was involved, but she just said, I will never be in Bally Halbert, and she never was. Well, it was just like anyone who has any, even the smallest thing they think could help, if they would ring the, the confidential line, if they don't want to ring the police direct, just ring. I remember Dad speaking but we were told to speak to Lisa. Because if she was watching, then if she had gone of her own free will, she might see this and come back. But we knew Lisa wouldn't have gone of her own free will. She would never, ever have put us through what we were feeling. And if she is out there and she sees all this uh, involvement with the police and the media, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it, come back. Everything's just, please come back. We don't care. The media don't care, the police don't care. Everybody, Everybody wants her back. Everybody wants to find her. I remember Dad saying, Lisa, if you can see this, it doesn't matter what's happened. Doesn't matter. If you've got into bother, doesn't matter. Just come home, whatever it is, we'll sort it out. And it was just horrible to even hear him say those words. And to see him upset, because you just never saw your dad upset, did you? We started off counting Lisa's being missing as days, day one, day two, and we still refer to those days up until day nine. And day nine is when it was declared to be a murder investigation. We found out that the police were now going to be treating Lisa's disappearance as a murder. What we didn't know at the time was while we had the official contact from the, from the police, that Lisa's family didn't know this. And then we had a face a very difficult situation in a sitting room with a family who looked at us with absolute, I can't even begin to explain the pressure that was in that room and the feelings that were in that room. And I can't begin to explain just the, the emotion. It was suffocating. A superintendent came down 
sat on the corner of the settee and, I mean, you just, you, everything washed out of your body. You couldn't take it in. It was like being in a different world. It was scary, very scary. From then, it felt like one day was the same as the next, and the next, and the next. And I remember you open your eyes in the morning, and just for a wee second, it wasn't there. And then you remembered another day without Lisa. It's been 10 days since Lisa Dorian was last seen alive, leaving this caravan park in Ballyhalbert at 5 a.m. after a party. Her family made appeals for information at the weekend, but now they've been told the news they had been dreading. Miss Dorian was a 25-year-old shop assistant, and before the missing persons case became a murder inquiry, there had been extensive air and land searches along the Arts Peninsula. Underwater search teams had also been used but the woman's body has yet to be found. We talk to anybody now at this stage. People have approached us and at first we said no, we didn't want any investigation, just the police and leave it at that. But it's getting that, it's getting that frustrating time now that we'll just talk to anybody. People tried to help and people wanted to help. But all we got was rumour upon rumour upon rumour. And the police acted on all of that. Once the major investigation started into Lisa's murder, one of the first tasks clearly was, was the huge search operation that was undertaken, not just in Ballyhalbert, but across um, many other parts of Northern Ireland too. The lines of inquiry centred around individuals who had a reason to cause Lisa harm. The lines of inquiry involved, for example, you know, theories that Lisa's body had been taken out to sea, um, for which there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Um, a theory that Lisa's um, body had been placed into the boot of a car and taken away from the caravan park and had then crashed. We recovered the car and forensically examined it. There's no evidence whatsoever that that car accident is linked in any way to Lisa's disappearance. The amount of information that came in was really, really quick, and it was complex, and some of it actually was inconsistent, and some of it was competing, and that was a real challenge for the original investigation team to sift through what was rumour, speculation and gossip, and what was actually fact. We were having highs and lows because the police brought forward things and we thought then we'd have some outcome, but there was always nothing leveled off again. So I, to cope with it, do not raise my hopes um, when anything comes forward. I wait to see the, the result of it. That's how I cope. For the second day running, the police and forensic officers have continued to search the backyard of a house in Ballywalter. A man from the village who was arrested in connection with Lisa's murder has been released without charge. The third man to be questioned by detectives investigating the murder. Lisa's former boyfriend was a guy with a criminal record. Lisa had split up with him in the days prior to her disappearance, and it was because of that that he was initially wrongly suspected of, of involvement in her death. And the police are treating him as a witness, they aren't treating him as a suspect. I do not believe he had any role in Lisa's murder or disappearance. There was so much talk about what could have happened or what people believed had happened, but none of it was the truth. A family desperate for information about their loved one, today making a further appeal for help, this time with the offer of a £10,000 reward to find her body. We are distraught over her death and we'll grieve for the rest of our lives, but we cannot grieve properly 
until we've been able to give her a proper Christian burial. Lisa was last seen at this caravan site. Despite extensive air, land and sea searches, there has been no trace of the 25-year-old. There have been suggestions her murder may be linked to members of the LVF. There was obviously talk that the, the LVF had been involved and all the graffiti had gone up all over the, the walls, all down the peninsula, LVF lady killers. We knew that we were in territory that we knew nothing about. The loyalist volunteer force was born out of a split within the UVF in the mid-1990s. The LVF developed uh, pockets of strength in, in Hollywood, North Down, pockets of East Belfast, North Belfast. They had been involved in clashes with the UVF and the Red Hand Commando. There was bad blood between them, really serious bad blood. The police find themselves accused of standing by as Northern Ireland suffers the most violent summer of recent years. 160 extra officers have been drafted in to police the feud. Lisa going missing and Lisa's murder offered the UVF an opportunity to pin the blame on the LVF. Certainly the UVF during that summer where they were killing people who they were accusing of having associations with the LVF. Part of the reasoning that they were using for that, part of the justification that they were using for that was, sure, wasn't this the gang that murdered Lisa Dorian? It wasn't true. After meeting police, David Irvine speaks publicly for the first time on the Lisa Dorian murder. The politician met a senior detective on Tuesday to tell what he was hearing inside the Loyalist community. David Irvine contacted us to talk about, about Lisa and what he had heard from his Loyalist sources. We sort of thought, let's listen to him. Let's hear what he has to say. David Irvine obviously had a lot of influence in Loyalism at that time. I know he met senior Loyalists within the UVF and the Red Hand Commando, but on each occasion, we believe that he was met once again with a wall of silence. I think his intentions were honourable. I think he did genuinely try and help that family. But he was given a bomb steer. But he wasn't the only one at the time who was given a bomb steer. The media were given a bomb steer. Politicians were given a bomb steer. The police were given a bomb steer. And this was all deliberate. This was all by a little clique of, of loyalists who were putting out this information, no, knowing that it was going in the wrong direction, knowing that it would not lead to the recovery of Lisa's body. And they were doing that to protect the killer. The connection to paramilitaries and paramilitarism in Northern Ireland was really dangerous because what happened then was that the public would have turned off from trying to help Lisa. Because rather than reading the story, the story in entirety, they maybe just saw an LVF, UVF link in a headline and, and made the connection there with her name, and then they don't want to read any more. Well, that then means they don't want to be involved in helping any more as well, which is really dangerous. The fact that there appeared to be paramilitary connections meant that people were looking at it as a throwback to the conflict years, but it wasn't really. It was a different context that we should have been looking at. It was the context of um, a certain type of society that doesn't respect women and that is very easily uh, attuned to, to violence against women. Lisa's disappearance occurred in that context. It was a context of disrespect of, of women more than it was anything to do with the Troubles or the, or the legacy of the Troubles. It's true to say that during that period, you know, large numbers of people that would have been in and around the kind of drug scene and, and, and the party scene may well have had links to individuals within loyalism, but there's absolutely no information, no evidence to suggest that any of those links are relevant in any way to Lisa's disappearance. It was a particularly poignant day for the Dorian family, nearly four months on from Lisa's disappearance from a caravan park in Ballyhalbert. Her family marked her 26th birthday today by releasing 26 white balloons, each with a personal message attached. We know Lisa would have been celebrating with us today. And 
just say to these people, I mean, they can see what we're going through. Please, please just tell us where she is. At the start of this campaign, you had Lisa's family uh, speaking out about trying to find her, what happened. They've been very vocal. They have had a campaign where we had billboards. We also had advertisements in cinemas to remind people about Lisa. My lovely sister, Lisa Dorian, disappeared last year. We've been told to accept that she's dead, but we can't do that until we lay her to rest. We also had the band Snow Patrol get involved. When they put Lisa's photograph back in the media, it's also aimed, I think, at those who were involved in this. They maybe think they've escaped justice. I don't think they have. I really do genuinely believe that the police are doing the utmost to try and find out what happened, and that's through working closely with the family and their determination to keep her memory alive. Lisa was partying in the caravan with a group of people. They were all taking drugs. They were all drunk, bar one person. There was only one person there who wasn't taking drugs. As the night progressed, everyone left, bar Lisa and a 17-year-old teenager who worked as a groundsman at the site. Both of them were intoxicated. Both of them were taking drugs. In his testimony to police, he says that he seen lights outside, they, they heard noises, and both of them fled into the night. Um, Lisa wasn't seen again. We were kind of stuck with this story, which was very bizarre, to say the least. That is the story that journalists had. Um, there wasn't any evidence coming forward as to anything else having happened but it always was a quite bizarre story. You know, most people's instinct when they hear noises or um, see things happening is to lock, lock a door. You know, it's not to run out into it. Lisa Dorian was last seen alive at a caravan site in Ballyhalbert early on Monday the 28th of February 2005. Ten years on, police and the family again have appealed for information. As long as somebody comes along with that vital, insignificant piece of information that might help to solve this, and that is bury our daughter. My mum is a really really, really maternal person. But when Lisa went missing, my mum totally changed. It affected Patricia a lot. Like we tried to, you know, help her along, but it just went downhill gradually. I'm not going into too many details, but it did it destroy her life. She just lost her zest for life. As the months went on, she just lost all her, her spirit. There was just, she said she just didn't want to be here anymore. hard to deal with trauma on trauma. It was like, we've had enough, we've had enough to deal with. You know, it's just. We didn't deserve all that extra heartache. Mum didn't deserve all that extra heartache. You know? When I first really got to know the Dorian family was through an article I did with the convicted murderer, Jimmy Seals. He claimed to have information about where Lisa's body had been moved. 
I don't think Seals had anything to do with Lisa's disappearance. I want to make that clear. But he received information in relation to where she may have been and how she may have died. My understanding is that the police went to McGabry Prison and spoke to Seals, and Seals conveyed the same information to them. Um, the ser further searches took place at the land where he claimed that he believed Lisa may have been buried. This morning, the police cordoned off an area of farmland on the outskirts of Cumber, and specialist search teams moved in to begin a sweep of the terrain. The searches we conducted in, in Cumber in very recent years were as a result of information that came into the investigation team that suggested that Lisa's body may have been deposited on, on land in Cumber, but the information is not sufficiently precise to give us an exact location, an exact kind of X marks a spot, if you like. When we are going through searches and certain parts of the investigation, it's, it's, it takes over your mind. You know, you're totally distracted because it literally just consumes you, you know. Any search that goes on, it, everything from that day just comes back and that's what you're living with. That's what your mind is like. It's just like a whirlwind of all those memories that takes you back to day one. That's, that's what it feels like. I believe that Seals believed what he was telling me. The searches took place at the land where he believed Lisa may have been buried. They uncovered nothing. I don't believe that the location where Jimmy Seals gave the police, or told the police where Lisa was buried is, is accurate. I believe that Lisa Dorian was buried in close proximity to the caravan where she was last seen alive. Fourteen years after Lisa Dorian disappeared, another search. The operation focusing on ground behind the caravan park, part of a disused airfield. I've always believed the answers lie in Ballyhalbert. There's no evidence that Lisa had a means to escape Ballyhalbert. She wasn't equipped for cold weather. She had no money. She had no passport. She had no mobile phone. The only explanation for her not being in Ballyhalbert is that somebody else has taken her away from that location. But in taking her away from that location, that individual, first of all, had to be in that location. And that's why I believe that the answers lie in Ballyhalbert. In the footsteps of a daughter and sister, hope and heartbreak. People can't imagine what this feels like. They can't imagine what it feels like not knowing where she is. Um, my mum passed away a few years ago, and she never never got the answers that she needed. It ruined her life and it has ruined our lives. <laughs> this operation is going over old ground with new technology. The searches that we conducted at the airfield were very much directed by our investigative thinking. I felt that with the passage of time, we now had the technology, the equipment and the training to be able to establish whether she was in any of those kind of concealed spots that may not have been able to be accessed by search teams previously. What we're looking for is we're looking for significant voids in the ground or we're looking for significant buildings or um, remains of buildings into which a body could actually be physically hidden. So it wasn't important for me that we looked at every blade of grass or every rock or every stone. It was most important that we identify the areas in which a body could be deposited and not be found for 16 years. But as soon as we realised that Lisa's body, as far as we can reasonably establish, wasn't on the airfield, we then started to think about, OK, well, if she's not there, how do we start to work out in concentric circles away from the airfield? Where's the next most logical place? Where else can you dispose of a body very quickly that you don't expect to have? And that's what took us to the clay pits. 16 years and still waiting to bring Lisa's body home. This area has been searched before in the early days when Lisa was still a missing person. This is the first time it's being searched for her body. In my view, that was a purpose-built body deposition site. It's perfect. And we know that in 2005, the, some areas of the clay pits actually were searched, but they weren't searched to the extent that I thought I needed them to be searched to give me confidence that Lisa's body wasn't there. This new detective, Mr Murphy, 
he started from scratch again and they had a lot of lakes searched and I was down at them and saw it happening and the divers did everything and found various things but didn't find anything belonging to Lisa or anything about her. You just go down and you go along with it. But again, as I said, I stay at one level. If I let myself get more involved, you just be destroyed. You can't do it. You just can't do it. This is a process of elimination before we can start to move further afield outside of the airfield, the clay pits, and then ultimately outside of Ballyhalbert. But before I go there, I want to establish that she's not there in the first place. Those with the information, the individual, the two people that the police believe helped that individual dispose of Lisa's remains. You have three people there who know what happened, who know why Lisa was murdered and why she disappeared and why she was buried. The problem for the police is they haven't yet to come forward. They have this culture of secrecy. They're surrounded in this wall of silence and they, they won't break it. So that's been a frustrating element for the police, but I think they are uh, determined to find out uh, what happened to her. They remain committed to find out where she is. And hopefully at the end of that process, we do see someone before the courts. People describe the Lisa Dorian story as a murder, but to my mind, it's a love story. And it's about the love of a family for a young girl whose life ended very abruptly when she had the whole world ahead of her. But you know, it, it sort of pains me to say it, but there's, there's another love story here as well. There's another family. And at the heart of that family is a murderer. Can you imagine what's not said on a daily basis? Can you imagine them leaving the house and saying, I love you, brackets, I know you're a murderer, brackets. Two very different love stories, where you've got the Dorians who don't have any brackets at the end of their sentences because they know the love and they're honest and they're open. Now, the other family has all those brackets at the end of all their sentences and it must be an awful situation. But you know, it could stop. It could stop. I'm in a very fortunate position. I have the absolute confidence of Lisa's family, but I also benefit from the huge amount of work that's been done by my predecessors. The three years of work that I've been doing on this investigation has been to look at all of the information, all of the evidence, holistically, rather than a single strand. Because each individual single strand is capable of diverting the investigative mind away from actually what is at the nub of it, and that is who had the means, motive, and opportunity to kill Lisa Dorian? Those are the three questions I'm seeking to answer. Whilst we've done an awful lot of searches, and you know the searches that we've done mo most recently, the fact that we haven't found Lisa doesn't mean that we've given up on those searches. My view has always been, before I start to extend beyond Ballyhalbert, I want to be as certain as I can that Lisa's not there to start with. Alongside the search activity, there's as much work going in to the investigative element of this as there is going into the search element of it. So it remains a very active twin track for us. And could you say that you are in the position now where you have one theory in mind for what happened to Lisa? Yeah, uh, the, the work that we've been doing over the last number of years, Joanne, has been to look at each of the theories that have been advanced, I haven't closed my mind to any of those other lines of inquiry because to do so would just put blinkers on me and would result actually in me just, you know, going headstrong after one particular line that I thought was particularly appealing. So we haven't closed our minds to any of those things. But what I, what I have done is I've started to think in a practical way about what the evidence tells me. It brings me down to my own personal hypothesis but without setting aside any of the hypotheses that have come before. The police at the minute, I think, believe that they are closer to recovering Lisa's body than they have ever been at any point. People have got their hopes up over the past 15, 16 years that they may recover it. There's been a lot of false dawns. 
I do think this time it, it, it might be different. I think, I think the cops are, I think the cops are getting there. I really do. Loyalists are in no doubt who murdered Lisa Dorian. The Dorian family are in no doubt who murdered Lisa Dorian, and the police are in no doubt who murdered Lisa Dorian. I have huge amounts of hope. Our investigative approach, our investigative mindset has been in exactly the right place. Our resilience and confidence to push forward and to try and find those small pieces of information that enable me to piece together the jigsaw that is the 16 years since Lisa Dorian disappeared. And I hope one day to be able to put a case before the prosecution service in Northern Ireland to enable them to consider whether the evidence supports a prosecution for individuals in connection with Lisa's murder. We still always have hope. We always have an opportunity to find Lisa because they're not above the law. The police have never worked harder to try and get someone to justice. And, you know, I'm confident that we're going to be able to do that. And in doing that, whether that means we find Lisa first or after, I do believe we're going to get both. We are always hopeful in some way, shape or form because you can't ever think to yourself that it's never going to happen, that you're never going to get that breakthrough. You know, you, we genuinely believe that we will get there, you know. Like, we can't let this go until we get Lisa, do you know, and we never will, you know. We do all this for Lisa. We don't do it for ourselves. She deserves us to campaign for her. She deserves to be found. She deserves to have a Christian burial. She doesn't deserve to be out there on her own. Nobody even knowing where she is. Completely unmarked. You wouldn't treat an animal like that. So that's what gets me out of bed in the morning.